My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hi, I'm Jessica Van, and today's leadership quote comes from Richard Branson. Train people well enough so they can leave. Treat them well enough so they don't want to. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. Welcome to episode 72. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. I'm excited to share today's interview, but first I wanted to share a quick note about this episode's sponsor. Life Squire is an assistant resource center focused on matching executives with assistants and creating relationships where both sides thrive. They would love to help you find the perfect job or work with you to enhance your skill set. Check them out at lifesquire.com slash leader assistant, or call them at 405-889-4430. Again, lifesquire.com slash leader assistant. Also a quick note, so today I'm interviewing Jessica Van from Maven Recruiting Group, And she interviewed me on her podcast for assistance called Reach. And you can find my interview um, on her show. It's episode 20. So look up the Reach podcast for assistance on Apple or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. And look up episode 20. That's my interview where um, I'm actually the interviewee for once. So you can check that out and uh, subscribe to her show as well. All right, let's jump into today's interview. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Leader Assistant Podcast. It's your host, Jeremy Burrows, and today I'm speaking with Jessica Van. Jessica founded Maven Recruiting Group, a renowned recruiting brand specializing in connecting high-leverage executive assistant and operations hires. Jessica, how's it going? It's going well. Thank you, Jeremy. How about yourself? Doing well. I'm excited to chat with you today. Uh, tell us a little bit about Maven Recruiting and you know who you guys are and uh, what you do. Yeah. So Maven is a recruiting firm that has specialized in placing executive assistants and operating staff, uh, administrative assistants to really the the movers and shakers and some of the most illustrious companies, executives, and brands um, in both the Bay Area and beyond. Um, We work with a number of different types of industries. And um, in addition to our work as a recruiting firm and and in addition to um, supporting the EA community for the last decade with with these types of of searches and roles, we also have a podcast. And um, I host that. And um, it's a podcast that's focused on, again, really um, providing a resource for the EA community and really helping to uh, hopefully serve and inspire and guide uh, them through pivotal moments in their careers. That's great. So why and when did you decide to start Maven? Well, the when is the easier part to answer. Um, <laughs> the when would have been, let's see, we just celebrated our 10-year, well, celebrated is a, a bit of an overstatement because we didn't get to celebrate our 10-year. Mm. We made 10 years as a business. The celebration is yet to come. Unfortunately, um, the COVID crisis put a, a damper on all of our celebratory plans. But um, we look forward to all of the feathers and balloons and glitter and champagne that is in our future. Um, but yeah, I started the company in <clears throat> March of 2010. Um, and it was at really kind of the 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 bottom of what was then, um, I guess the last recession that we, that we dealt with, um, as a population. Um, and everybody thought I was nuts because who starts a business at the bottom of the recession? Um, 
and also unbeknownst to me was pregnant with my first child at the time. So yet again, who starts a business when they're pregnant and in a recession? <laughs> <laughs> not not the best combination of factors. But so that's the when. Um, the why, I think there's so many ways that I could answer that question. Um, I think that for me, you know, entrepreneurship isn't so much a choice as it is a destiny. And I think that um, the circumstances of, of how I grew up and, and kind of seeing, you know, um, a mother toil endlessly in a job that just really kind of enslaved and dehumanized her was a very, was a very impressionable and formative experience for, for me. And I think that there was always this desire in me to not ever be at the beck and call of someone else or to have to be um, to have to answer to someone else, be, I think, because of that. Um, but I think that, you know, fundamentally in me as well, it was was this desire to create and to feel like I could really um, express my voice and my point of view in terms of how we operate in terms of, you know, creating the responsibility of creating the, a brand, the responsibility of, of driving value and creating value for customers and really figuring out how I wanted to show up um, as a as a as a service provider, as a partner. Um, so just that that whole opportunity to really influence that and and create something that that was reflective of me and, and my style and ultimately the broader company that um, that now is is in existence um, was really the, the exciting opportunity here. Um, and I think too, like as an employer, you know, there, there was a, a real excitement and desire to create a company that really valued and acknowledged and um, supported the, the people within it. And so there's a number of ways that we've been able to do that. And and evolve the employee experience that you know that the people that work at Maven have, but that's been equally as exciting as the the fulfillment of you know growing this company and serving these CEOs and serving these executives and serving this community of executive assistants and you know Jeremy you you serve the same community right I mean you've done so much to really elevate the the EA brand and really support your community and I think that. That's been one of the really satisfying things of, of creating this company. And the other really satisfying thing is creating a place that people genuinely love to work at and um, that people find a real sense of home and belonging in and a real sense of, of support and fulfillment and figuring out how to do that for them and how to um, reward them and show up for them has been the other part of this journey that's been really exciting. So, Yeah. Does that answer your question? It does. Or did I, or did I answer it too much? No, no, that's great. <laughs> what, I, I do have yeah. a couple follow-ups. Um, sure. Is there one one or two tips or maybe is there one thing that you did that, uh, you know, speaking of, of being in the recession and we're kind of in a crazy year in 2020 and is there something that you could share that you learned that EAs could kind of apply to their context um, as far as, you know, <laughs> starting a business in the middle, in the bottom of a recession? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, uh, so in, in terms of applying that, that story to an executive assistant audience, um, I think that what we're fundamentally talking about, whether you're, you're talking about being an entrepreneur or, you know, working for an executive, um, whatever your con your particular context might be, I think that I think that the the overarching um, thread that binds both of those 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 two those two things is um, a belief that you will prevail. And I think that that's the that's the common ground. And I think that's really what carried me through that time was that no matter how bizarre um, <laughs> things might have been at the time or how kind of, you know, um, discouraging you could have, have seen the circumstance, I think that it never rocked me. And um, I think that, you know, whether you're talking about being an entrepreneur or whether you're talking about being an executive assistant who's stepping into a new role 
or stepping outside of his or her comfort zone to try something different, whether it's a new executive or a new opportunity or a new industry or a new what have you. I think that you've got to lead with conviction and you've got to lead with confidence and, and, and belief in yourself. And, um, I, I, you know, I, again, like it, it never really, it, it didn't rattle me. I just, I think I knew that, that my fortitude would carry me through. And I think I knew that if I showed up in an earnest and sincere way and did good work and did good work by good people, that eventually it would it would sort of you know manifest, um, which is not to say that there were not a million you know challenging situations that, that happened along the way and discouraging moments, but over the overall um, theme was always that this will this will come together. Hmm. Well, it's interesting because that's really what makes an executive assistant a leader and uh, more effective is you know the top EAs in the world, they don't get rattled when everything else falls mm-hmm. apart. So it's a, it's a similar mm-hmm. uh, skill set. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what would be the other, the, or my other follow-up is why assistance? Why did you decide you could have chosen a whole, you know, hundreds yeah. of different roles to, to start a recruiting group for? Why assistance? Yeah. Well, let's see. Salespeople talk too much. No, I'm kidding. Salespeople <laughs> talk too much. They do, though. <laughs> and they're squirrely. I love them. They're great conversationalists. They're great to have dinner with, but I don't know that I'd want to deal with them all day long. <laughs> um, let's see. You know, to be perfectly candid with you, initially it was it was coincidence. Um, you know, I worked for another business <clears throat> be- before launching my own company. And I that was where they had the opportunity. It was, okay, hey. Uh, we have an opening with our administrative team. So that's what you're going to do if you want to work here. And I said, okay, great. I want to work here. So that's what I'll do. And so ultimately that's, you know, how I built my, my, my experience was, was because of that. And then I started, you know, really actually beginning to understand and appreciate and identify with this community. And I mean, I have to say, and you know this, Jeremy, because well, I've also I've I've read your book, and and obviously you're an assistant yourself, and you know um, many many assistants, so you know, I mean, these are some of the best stories you're ever going to hear, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who tells a better story than an executive assistant? You know, talking about the time when X, Y, and Z, right, and and how they were able just by the skin of their teeth to um, execute the impossible, right? So I, I think that I really. Um, really jived with and really began to appreciate just the vibrance and and vitality and um, charisma of this group of people and really also saw, and I think this is the other, the piece that really, you know, locked it for me, is that there was a real opportunity to help elevate the perception of this of this group of people, that oftentimes assistants would come in and they would meet with us and it, it was almost like they didn't quite know how to own um how instrumental they were. I think sometimes this this role appeals to a more humble type of person. Um, sometimes it's somebody that's less forward facing or less of a, a, a showman and a spotlight seeker. There's certainly exceptions to that. But I think that oftentimes there was this um, humility where they really didn't know how to advocate or didn't always you know, speak of themselves in the most um, complimentary of terms. And it was like an opportunity both in how we worked with them to really empower them and help them have these light bulb moments in recognizing their own value and how to speak to that value, um, which would ultimately help them drive career moves, drive compensation, drive promotions, drive opportunity, right? That that felt really good to be able to do that for people. And then on the other side, on the client side, it was a, a real opportunity as well to to educate and to say, hey, you know what? You want to be this type of person. You want to you want to perform at at this level, you know, on par with the the most efficient and effective and powerful executives out there. Well, this is how you need to do it. And you're not really leveraging all of the resources available to you. And here's how you can do this differently. And really turning on as well for them their awareness of how they could operate differently to be more um, to 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 be more accomplished and more successful. So it was really like a twofold thing of, of really being able to influence both sides of those, um, 
uh, I guess, both sides of the table, if you will, to, to bring them together in a more complementary way. That's great. So, and accountants, I just you know I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so you like assistance? <laughs> I do. I do like assistance. <laughs> um, so, what do your clients look for in an assistant? Yeah, um, a lot of things. So, um, you know, depending upon the client. Um, People come to that conversation with a different level of, of preparation and a, a, a different ideas, right? Some of them have been listening to their board and they have it in their head that, okay, well, you know, you're going to go public and we're, we're, we're gearing up for you to go public in a couple of years. So therefore, you need an assistant who's navigated, you know, a pre-IPO process and been through rapid scaling and this, that and the other and knows how to, you know, do the road shows and the this and the that. And sometimes, you know, what people look for is actually ends up being really an iterative and kind of evolutionary process, right? It, it ends up being very dynamic because sometimes it's, you know, they, they come into the process with one thing in mind, like, like what I described. And through the course of the search, we realize that that's really not what they need, that in fact, it's much more... Um, driven by the intangibles and that, you know, rather than the person that's done all of those things, that what we determine or find out is that, no, it's actually the charisma and that kind of um, being in lockstep with somebody and having that kind of mind meld or, you know, being finding an assistant who maybe hasn't done all of those things, but lo and behold, he or she is just, you know, gunning for an opportunity and just a total, you know, upstart whippersnapper and ready to throw themselves in to whatever and, and is kind of fearless. And we learn that that's what they need. Right. So it, um, so I guess to answer your question, it's a, it's an, it's an iterative process of what someone needs and it, and it depends. And that's part of the discovery that we go through when we sit down with a client is let's really dig in and what do you think you need, but what do you actually need? What are your actual challenges? What are you actually struggling with? What's, you know, what, 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 what does your day to day look like and what's bogging you down? Um, that being said, I think that there's still some common threads, um, that virtually all executives look for. And, um, just off the top of my head, I would say those are things like loyalty, um, I think it's very hard for an executive to feel comfortable um, partnering, um, going through all of the effort that it takes to build a relationship, right? Being vulnerable, being open, sharing, investing in that, that you know, that partnership if they don't feel like the assistant is someone that's going to stick around. So I think somebody that, that can demonstrate loyalty um, and who values loyalty is super important. I think discretion is always a, a key one. Nobody wants an assistant who's going to overshare or, um, you know, divulge too much. Um, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but, you know, that, that kind of fortitude and that sense of composure um, no matter what the situation may be and, and the kind of person that doesn't, that doesn't add to the panic, but rather, you know, brings the, <laughs> brings the energy down when things get too escalated. Um, what are some other things? Um, I think a, oh, an ability to be really proactive and thoughtful, um, I think a, a, a helpful demeanor. So the kind of person that doesn't greet, you know, requests or new tasks with a kind of like uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of response, but rather is like, absolutely, you know, let's, let's do this. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an attitude thing. Um, the ability to, to, to be autonomous and to make autonomous decisions. Um, I don't know of any executive that wants to necessarily be a sounding board for every stage of your decision making, right? They want you to come with solutions and, and come prepared. So I think the ability to process thoughtfully and independently is really important. Yeah. Yeah. So, sound like a, you know? Yeah, sounds sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, what about interviewing? What's what's one tip as these EAs are going in and they're getting ready to interview with one of these executives that wants all that stuff you just mentioned and more? Uh, mm -hmm. What's what's your number one like crush an interview tip? Hmm. I think that 
the preparation is always key. Um, <clears throat> I, I know this is not necessarily revolutionary, but it, it, it really is true. So, um, I would, I think that more often than not, when a candidate doesn't move forward in the interview process, uh, usually it's because they weren't, they, they somehow, um, were not able to communicate their experience in a way that was compelling and that had resonance for the interviewer. So it's not to say that they don't have the experience. It's not to say that they haven't done those things, but maybe because of lack of preparation, maybe because of lack of, of confidence or conviction and how they spoke about it, it didn't, it didn't hit. And so I would encourage those who are interviewing to anticipate, you know, what are the scenarios that are likely going to be asked of me? How am I going to demonstrate, you know, that I'm proactive? Um, not just say it, but how am I actually going to demonstrate it? What are the two examples I'm going to cite to illustrate that? Um, how am I going to demonstrate that I have uh, the ability to remain calm in 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 the storm and chaos? What are those examples going to be? And I, I really do attribute, I mean, some people are just great at riffing and, and, and pulling, you know, um, from thin air, but most of us aren't, right? And most of us would benefit from, from that. So, um, as well, I would say that, you know, too many words end up sounding, um, unconfident. And I think that it's very easy to lose your message. So I would encourage our, um, the, the people who are, who are interviewing to not only prep those and plan ahead, but, you know, role play it a little bit, um, maybe write it out. But remember that it's, it's all about high information, to word ratio, right? Fewer words, more information, and let's just hit it on the head. So are there any words that you can think of that are like, don't use these words? I can imagine like a, a, a list of words that are okay generally, but they're not very helpful or they can kind of raise a red flag in the interview process. Mm, uh, mm -hmm. Like an like example might well, be, you know, <clears throat> I, I might personally think that I I value my you know my family life and boundaries and work life balance and all that but maybe the using the word boundary in an interview triggers something mm -hmm. in an executive that says oh this guy doesn't want to work. <laughs> mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah. Um I mean I think there's there's different theories on that. Um some people would argue that being really um forthcoming with what you need, um, at some point, not necessarily in the first two minutes of the interview, right. But, mm -hmm. but at some point in the interview process over that courtship, right. Of two, three, four conversations that you actually are forthcoming about, Hey, I'm a father. I have two children. Um, you know, these are my kind of parameters and this is when I'm available. And then I take this break because I, this is my family time and this is my carve out. And then I'm, and then I'm yours again. Right. So I actually do think that there's merit, um, and value in, in speaking your truth and, and, and what it is that you need to, to be fulfilled over the long term. Because again, I think that goes back to, you'll be more loyal and you'll be more invested if you're actually, you know, um, entering into the partnership with the right understandings and mutual understandings. Um, that being said, I think that there's certain things that, you know, just always don't play well. Right. So, um, any, any kind of bad mouthing whatsoever of your former executive, regardless of how deserved or undeserved it might have been, it just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't play well. Um, I think that people want to know that you come to, that you, that you greet challenging situations with solutions as opposed to, um, gossip, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So it's like, well, what did you do to evolve a challenging situation as opposed to taking a resigned approach or even worse, just kind of, you know, bad mouthing, um, that, that doesn't, that doesn't land well. Um, what else does not land well? Um, I think having sort of flippant reasons for why you've left roles, <clears throat> I would really be thoughtful in, in how you communicate that. Um, you know, especially if there's if there's a lot of of movement i think that you really need to to anticipate that there's going to be some pushback on that 
and be really thoughtful about how you articulate that. If it sounds like someone's the type of person that just kind of, um, uh, you know, throws in the towel when things get uncomfortable or challenging, again, that, that's going to be hard to rebound from. Mm-hmm. So just be mindful of kind of the, the, the messaging and, and how you're, you know, how you're, how you're telling your story. So those are some great tips. And a lot of that can kind of translate into not just in the interview, but on your LinkedIn profile or in your social media. What's something that you would encourage assistants to stop doing as it relates to you know, marketing themselves for a new role? And then what's something you would encourage them to start doing? Yeah. So on the stop doing side, um, sometimes people get, um, they go down a rabbit hole of wanting to create like a a really fancy uh, resume that's got colors and graphics and, and, you know, is, is really, um, unique in terms of how they display their experience. I would say that 99.9% of the clients um, prefer a much more kind of cut and dry format. And in fact, you know, as recruiters, that's the first thing that we'll ask you to do. If if you come in with something that's got all kinds of, um, you know, bells and whistles, we'll ask you to, to just pare it back and kind of sanitize it, if you will. Um, so I, I think that just that is an important thing um, just from a, a formatting perspective. Um, as far as social media posturing, this is so, 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 so important. I can't underscore this enough. And yet it continues to happen that, you know, there's discrepancies in people's um, stories. So if your resume does not align to the story that you're conveying about yourself and your brand, um, in social media or through LinkedIn, you know, that's going to be a red flag. Um, more and more and more people are divulging and sharing more of their lives, um, through social media outlets, whether it's blogging or Instagram or Facebook or Twitter posts or what have you. And I just encourage everyone to know that whatever it is that you're putting out there is going to become part of your archive and part of your personal um, directory. <laughs> so, it, it, which is not a statement one way or the other, except to say know that that's that that's a fact. And so, whatever you put out there, just know that that's now going to enter into the um, ecosystem of information that this potential employer is going to use to evaluate you on. And is this, in fact, you know? what you, what you want out there. And if it is great. And if it's not, you know, think twice. Um, so yeah, I just, you know, we are, we live in a very transparent time. So I guess that's, that's on the, the stop doing part of the, of the uh, answer to your question, the start doing part. Um, I would say that I think more often than not, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, that sometimes it's sort of, um, the nature of the people in this role that, that they undersell themselves. And so I can't tell you how many times I've sat down with an amazing candidate who, you know, has accomplished so, so much and looking at the resume, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get that. Right. Um, so what I would encourage is not just to sit down with your resume as kind of the static document, but I would encourage you to actually sit down with somebody who's willing to listen and talk about what you've done. Talk about how do you spend your time? What are the, what are the problems that you're solving on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly type of a basis? What are the situations that you find yourself in? Who are the people that you're talking to and interfacing with? Because I think in breathing life into those moments and um, experiences, it will actually reveal the extent of what you do. And it's so easy to just take for granted, oh, well, I forgot that, yeah, when I'm planning the board of directors meeting, oh my goodness, and the board of directors is, you know, this A-list group of, you know, top 50, you know, fortune, what what have you, executives. 
yeah, that's a big deal, you know, but, but maybe that person is taking it for granted that it's just, it's just sort of, you know, commonplace. And so they don't think to, to mention it. So talk to somebody or talk to yourself or whatever, but I think through, through the narrative, you might actually get more, um, you might find more things that you can talk about. So that's one thought I would also say, and I promise this is not a shameless plug, but I would also say that it's really valuable to connect with a good recruiter. Um, and what I mean by that is that a good recruiter will act as a looking glass and help you really be help be a mirror for for you and will help but through the through the questions that they ask you through the dialogue that they have with you, through how they guide you through that discovery process of and, and probe you for what you really want and what's really going to satisfy you and what are the situations that you want to avoid and all of these things, you know, they're going to help you arrive at a, at a, at a place where either you're going to, you know, land the, the dream job because they've now eliminated and helped you pare down, um, positions and companies and executives that weren't the right fit for you, or they're going to help you refine the picture of what you're looking for so you can go after that and be more clear and more directed in how you approach your search process. So regardless of how you landed the job, I think that it's a really valuable process to go through in in your discovery phase. Hmm. Love it. I'm over here taking notes uh, in case I need, <laughs> need this in the future. Uh, well, Jessica, thank you so much. Let's uh, let's wrap things up with a question about you. What is one thing you want everyone to know about you? Oh, boy. This was the hardest one for me <laughs> to, to think about. Save the um, best for last. Yeah. So, um, so when I was... 18. Well, yeah. Graduating from high school, 17, 18, whatever it was. Um, our, t one of our teachers had us do this exercise where it was like, we were supposed to write a letter to our future selves. Right. And then at our 10 year reunion, they were going to give them to us. And of course, by the time 10 years rolls around, you've long since forgotten <laughs> what, in, what in the world you wrote, what state of mind you were in, what was going on with you. That's all, you know, that's a bygone. Um, and I almost didn't even go to my 10 year reunion, to be honest with you, but I, but I did. And at the end of the night, um, they handed us an envelope and it had the letter in it. And of course, you know, I'd completely forgotten about it. So my best friend and I, uh, duck out and, and kind of go and, and uh, open up the letter and we're you know skimming and, and, and eager to read and see what it is that we said to ourselves 10 years ago. And it was really kind of a cool moment for me and like a, one of those kind of surreal sort of full circle moments because I basically mapped out my future and I, and I, and it was, and it was kind of startling to see that I was, you know, yeah, there were some differences, but by and large, I was living the life that I had articulated for myself and said I would achieve, um, you know, 10 years later. And it's just interesting to know that you, that, you know, that we're kind of, in a weird way, like we're already sort of formed, you know, and it's weird to think that at 17 or 18 that, you know, you might have so, so much insight into yourself. But um, it was pretty cool to see that. And it was really a very affirming moment, I think, too, in, in terms of thinking about the importance of, um, of affirming what it is that you want, in terms of thinking about, um, you know, articulating and really being clear with yourself and your intentions and, and kind of how can you manifest things in your life. And so for me, it was a really a powerful moment in revealing that. And so now the letter lives on my desk. And so when you come into my office, um, it's framed and there it is. And for me, it's, it's like, um, it's a statement about, um, staying, you know, staying true to your desire and, um, and how to achieve what it is that you truly want. That's awesome. Well, let's, uh, 
why don't you share where we can find Maven and how um, EA is listening if they're interested in just learning more about what you're up to or if they're even looking for a job right now or think they might be looking for a job in the future, near future. Uh, where can they find what you're up to and how can they reach out to you? Yeah. Um, so a couple of ways. So, uh, of course, through our website, www.mavenrec.com, you can find um, anything from contact information for how to reach out to us to um, links to the blog that we update and maintain to positions that we're working on to case studies and examples of the types of roles and executives and companies that we support and work with. Um, and uh, if you are, as you mentioned, uh, a candidate seeking representation, of course, we'd love to hear from you. And similarly, if you're a, a client or you're someone who's looking for help with a higher um, no matter how obtuse and challenging you think it might be, we're, we're, we're up for the challenge and would love to hear from you as well. And um, as well, we have a, a podcast. Um, it's called Reach, and it's a podcast for executive assistants. So to the extent that you're interested in um, hearing from others in our community and network, we've put together an, a lot of resources there as well to help guide um, executive assistants through what we think are likely to be the pivotal moments and challenges um, that they encounter um, in their careers as EAs. So would love for you to find us there too. Yeah, and I'll definitely post the link to the to your website and uh, the Reach podcast as well. Uh, definitely hop on um, whatever app you're listening to this and and subscribe to the Reach podcast as well. So thanks again, Jessica. I really appreciate it. Uh, have a good one, and we'll talk soon. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for, for having me as a guest, and I, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks again, Jessica. Thank you to LifeSquire for sponsoring. Check out this episode's show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 72. Go